Hello, loves. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Nina with Fashion Squared, and I have the most amazing special guest to share with all of you today. Candace Moore has been actually a friend of mine for almost 20 years. Candace yes. is the owner of More Grace, a company dedicated to healing, restoration, and hope at the soul level. Candace is a transformational leader, a powerful motivational speaker, a gifted storyteller, and published author. Candace, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. So excited to be here. Always good to see you, my friend. How are you? I am doing good. We're actually recording this on Love Day. And, right. you, and you were just sharing uh, how amazing it would be if every day was love day. Right. And for that, we are each responsible. And for that, we are each responsible. I love that. I love that. Let's get into it. I have so many questions for you. Can you uh, first share a little bit about your story and what inspired you to get into the trauma and emotional fitness and wellness space? Yeah, thank you for asking. And, and Nina, thanks for allowing me to be a part of your podcast. You know that I have so much love for you and respect for what you do and how you move and show up on the planet. So I, I first want to just establish that space because it's very important. I feel so honored. Um, my background is one that involves a lot of trauma, extreme trauma. And what I don't subscribe to is someone else assigning my narrative and assigning my identity. And so it um, has been important for me to redefine, reconceptualize what the public, what individuals think someone who comes from my background would be, would sound like, how I would show up. And, you know, so I made the decision early on. I came from a space of, you know, foster homes and hardcore extreme abuse in my family and then um, alcoholism and all that that brought with it. And so when my life started coming together, one, when I got sober, when my life started coming together, what I realized is that I didn't just want to look good and get a great uh, job that looked good on paper. I wanted to be someone who didn't forget those who were still where I was. And so it has become important to me over the years. Um, while I was in a corporate space, I still did the work that I do now full time. And that is developing workshops to help individuals look at their core beliefs, right? When we have traumatic experiences, they shape us. They influence how we think. They, they affect our emotional vision. They influence the decisions we make, what we ask for, what we settle for. And so the work I do is to work with other individuals in different spaces, whether it's nonprofit, someone in a shelter, or whether it's someone in a C-suite position, but both to get unblocked, to look at how these experiences have shaped them and what it looks like to dismantle and repurpose that space. Mm. What do you find are some of the most common issues that happen inside businesses? I know you've worked in the corporate space. You work right. with corporate leaders and right. like you said, nonprofits, small businesses. What, what are some of the common issues that come up from those of us that do struggle with trauma? Or what are the signs that that we can look for in, 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 in that? There are many. Well, one of the signs is micromanaging right? Micromanaging, even when you're not in a leadership role, right? You'll find that um, trauma usually comes from a lot of chaos, uh, whether it's chaotic emotions or an outright chaotic environment. And so in order to feel secure, we have to know what's going on around us. And that sometimes uh, causes individuals to trespass, right? To move into someone else's lane. And that means you're either overly managing or you're just in, in someone else's business. <laughs> it's not yours. Mm -hmm. And so being mindful when we see those type of characteristics, um, you know, to show some compassion 
to ask, how would I want to be treated if this were me? What is the best method of communication? It's a little bit more challenging when you are not in a leadership role and, and it may be as your manager or the VP or senior VP that's behaving in this because it doesn't create an inclusive environment. And so that's why the work I do is so important when it comes to working with business owners or um, staff. And that is how do we create an environment where everyone has a voice? We have a lot of buzzwords now, diversity and equity. And so diversity is not just color. Diversity is someone who thinks differently, comes from a different culture, has a different way of of um, communicating any type of challenge or solution. They may be saying the exact same words, but because they're coming from this whole other rich space, the misinterpretation, the lack of communication, those fractures start to grow. And so to be able to come and identify that, hey, what does emotional dyslexia look like in a professional space, right? And that means I call something what it's not because I'm coming from a space of unhealed trauma and those wires get crossed and my vision gets blurred. Mm. Wow. That's it's a, a lot. lot. <laughs> that is a lot. I, I kind of it's picked a up a little bit of codependency energy when you're talking about micromanaging and tr trespassing. Right. Controlling. And, and yeah, there's so many. I mean, you know, when you get into the emotional fitness spectrum, it's going to show up. I mean, there's emotional martyrdom and that is people pleasing, right? You, you, I give and I give and I give and they just don't appreciate it, but you're not giving for fun and for free. You're giving with condition and you're not honest about it. Right. So I'm actually expecting something back, but I've not voiced that. And now I've created this oh, whole other narrative in my head. And so I'm showing up hostile. Right. And I always say showing up shut down. And that means I'm showing up. It looks like I'm present, but emotionally I'm shut down. I'm inaccessible. And so how does that impact those that I work with? How does that impact people on my team? Do they feel comfortable enough coming to me? We mm. have seen many changes since the pandemic. People are jumping ship now. I mean, you know, prior to the pandemic, you would have people staying in roles that they absolutely did not like for years. And so we're not even going to talk about how unhealthy that was. But now be, what, what happened with the pandemic is they learned, hey, this can go away just like that. People were being furloughed. Businesses were were shutting down. You know, if they were able to get a small loan, it might keep the doors open for a little bit. But a lot of people had to do other things. And so people are angry right now. They're angry that they, one, compromised their own truth to stay in an environment that did not support their growth and their development in a healthy way. And then they realized how quickly it could be taken. And so now they're showing up places and they're just waiting for the ball to drop. And so how do we address that, right? How do, and so the the way, one of the tools is we start having, you know, workshops that allow individuals to have a voice, to be respectful. We're in a, we're in a professional setting, but to have a voice so that they understand that they are an integral part of what we're doing here, whatever that looks like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And having that, that talk of speaking of buzzwords, that psychological safety, exactly. feeling, yeah, feeling, feeling connected. I have to go back to you. You were saying, um, the, the, uh, emotional martyrdom tied to right. people pleasing. And you, you said something that just like hit me in the best way. You said giving with condition. Yeah. Giving with condition. Right. Cause they're not honest. Right. So my workbook, let's mm. Our beliefs addresses the areas of our emotional makeup. And one of the sections has an emotional fitness spectrum, right? So it'll talk about emotional hoarding. When you're just holding on to stuff, you're not letting it go. I mean, for those who have seen the show Hoarders, you go in and there's all this stuff. There's broken dolls, they're missing limbs. And, and to that person though, there's a significance there and they're gonna fix that doll. They're gonna find that limb. You know what I mean? They're gonna yeah. do all this stuff. And, and But to someone coming in, you're just like, you gotta let this stuff go. And when you have had great loss, great emotional loss, so many adults are walking around with broken hearts, 
Mm. And it didn't start from their romantic partner. It started way before that. And so emotional hoarding is when you just can't stand to lose anything else. But what that looks like in a professional setting is you're coming to work with all this baggage, man, like all the. And so when someone walks into your office, they don't have like you'll see their posture. They feel stiff because there's so much stuff already there. And I don't mean physically, but the the energy there's so much stuff there. They don't even have the room to move around. And then emotional martyrdom is, you know, maybe if I just keep you happy, then I will be okay. But I'm not telling you, hey, there's an expectation here. And so what comes with emotional martyrdom is also people who speak victimese, mm. right? You, I, I'm either going to be accountable or I'm going to be a victim. I can't be both. And so there's so much opportunity when I start taking accountability for, is this what I want? If it's not, what am I willing to surrender? How am I going to repurpose this space? Mm. Emotional anorexia, saying I don't need what I need. Mm. Mm -hmm. All for protection, right? All for this, yeah. this yeah. belief that that's where we're safest. How do you recommend we hold space for someone who's struggling? Like in you know, we talk about the workspace. Of course, I work with a lot of salons and, you know, creative small businesses. How do we, what do we do when we recognize somebody that's struggling? The first thing is, you know, I treat it like addiction, right? So you'll hear people say, oh, they should have done, they should have done. At the end of the day, that person has to make their own decision. And so we're seeing a shift in the consciousness of society right now where we are we are not saying what we need to say we are uh, so politically correct that we're not getting to the root of what's going on and so how we hold space is to create a healthy environment again um you know social responsibility projects are good um, where you do things that maybe involve your staff in a way that creates opportunities to have other conversation right because we have to be mindful that when we're at work, we're at work to work. Sure. This is not a therapy session. We're at work to work. And so we first have to be able to respect that, that there is a bottom line that has to be met. And so creating a healthy environment is we do our individual works to show up as healthy as possible because the problem or the solution starts from the top. It always starts from the top. The person who oversees everything is going to set the tone. Absolutely. So I come to work and it's my deal and I'm not emotionally fit. I'm not doing what I need to do. Then that's going to eke out in different ways. And you'll see, you know, a lot of turnover in those spaces. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that because when I, I started our A school for uh, salon owners program. 10 years ago this year. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I, I set it up to where, um, and even said in, in the communications, we work from the inside out. And right. the first workshop I did was healthy boundaries, codependency and burnout. Yeah. Uh, and when uh, we have a team handbook template that we use with our clients and, and one of the things like that I recommend is if you, for instance, of course, if you worked at Passion Squared, healthy boundaries are a huge part <clears throat> of our culture, but you have to train to that, right? And right. I have to be, I, the leader, have to be right practicing that and understand that, not just say like, we practice healthy boundaries and then be super, you know, boundaryless. Super yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> Exactly. Right. And also understanding, I mean, you know, I do a lot of defining words. So when I'm doing in-person workshops or when I'm doing virtual workshops, I will, you know, we'll say respect. What does that look like? Shelter, right? Because there's another section in my workbook that deals with homelessness, emotional, mental, spiritual, physical. And physical is not on the street, although I used to live on the street over, you know, 25 years ago. And so coming from that space, understanding what it felt like to be in spaces where I wasn't safe, how I showed up when that's my mindset, that at any moment I could be harmed or I'm not protected. And so when we look at physical 
homelessness, it means I'm showing up in a space and I don't trust those around me. I don't mm. trust my surroundings. So what is the personality of someone who's showing up in that space? How does that show up? Same thing like this, the mindset of someone who has a scarcity mindset. You'll see one of the characteristics is scorekeeping, right? Mm. When I don't know that there's enough, I start keeping score. Well, so-and-so did this. And well, did you see when Susan did that, right? Because I'm, I'm steadily assessing my shelter. And so how do we create... Um, safe physical spaces. And again, that is really having regular meetings um, with your team. It could even be topic specific. It could be round robin. So if it's once a month, if it's once a week, you know, this week, so-and-so leads and, you know what I mean? Kind of put something on the table and gives an opportunity for everyone to show up and have a voice. I mean, when we say inclusive, um, and boundaries for me, it's, I don't use the word boundaries a lot. I use the word values. Mm. Have I developed my own value system? Because if I don't honor it, I can't expect you to. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then how do I communicate when I feel as if we are, we are out of alignment, right? So a lot of this is also learning a different language and that's a process. You know, we forget that all of this is a process. We're not ready made anything we grow mm. into. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I think of myself, I mean, just 20 years ago, like when we met, you know, right. um, which was a not awesome time in my life. Um, and you were such a incredible, just model and beacon of light for me back then. Uh, but yeah, I mean, even in the last, you know, five years, I mean, we're constantly growing one way or another, right? Right. right. What are some of your own practices that, that you focus on with your emotional fitness? Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that. So this morning I woke up, there's a, a workbook that I've had for a long time and and this was back in the day when uh, it was the it's the artist way. That's a book I'm referring to. So the artist way, and that that's when the Celestine prophecy and the secret, like all those books, were circulating. But the artist way, I really love. Um, Julia Cameron, the the author, uh, talks about morning pages, and that's like before you even get into the book. Morning pages are three pages written longhand and they're stream of consciousness. And you do it when you first wake up, before you look at your phone, before you do anything that's going to fill your, your mind with other stuff. And so, you know, I woke up this morning and I wrote three pages longhand. I don't think about it. It's to clear the mental clutter so that I can be present. And then I, I got up. I did my meditation and I, I worked out and working out is also a part of meditation. So I'm in Los Angeles and I work out constantly at the Culver City stairs, right? Because for me, um, you know, and I, I want to address that I have, you know, severe anxiety and depression and the methods I use are natural. And so working out is simply crucial, crucial to me being able to convert that energy, that and pen to paper, um, and then meditating, you know, visualization. I've had anxiety attacks on on the plane at 36,000 feet in the air. And so I have literally had to go within and clear that space out and visualize myself standing in an open space. But when I am doing meditation, I get to look at, okay, when I walk through the rooms in my house, in my emotional house, in my spiritual house, what is blocking my path? And am I willing to move that? Because when I come out of meditation, what does removing this item look like? What are the steps involved? Oftentimes we set people up for failure because we want them to just, well, get rid of it or just take it out. If they haven't gotten rid of it up to this point, that means they don't know how. Mm, yeah. So how can we guide them? How can, or how can we create a safe enough space where they're able to maybe not take it out, but they can move it to the door, right? So <laughs> it was in the bedroom. I moved it to the door. It's still in the house, but it's at the door. We're, you know, we're getting ready to get it out. And so for me, yeah, those are, are really, really important. And being honest, that's the other, that's a huge part of my emotional fitness is learning to be honest about where I am, what I'm doing, who I'm sharing space with, and whether or not it works. When did you 
when did you learn or when did you start learning to be honest with yourself? Like, how do we oh, build gosh. that self-awareness or wh when does yeah. that happen or how does that happen? Yeah. So stages, I feel that honesty is a process. It's not, it's not um, an immediate destination for me. I thought I was honest uh, based on where I was at my level of healing. And as I continue to heal, right, I, it's like pulling back the curtains, right? I have a wider vantage point. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't know that all this stuff was here. So I move further into honesty just means my truth, right? And in order for me to get to that, I have to unpack, right? So I unpack the things that are blocking me. How do I feel about this? There are there are um, experiences that I have found objectionable. Prior to me doing the work, I would have just said, it's okay, because I came from a place of scarcity. I came from a place of emotional anorexia, where I said I didn't need what I needed to be okay. And as I began looking at the physical responses, because we store trauma in our bodies. And so as I began looking at the physical responses or me wanting to sleep for like three days, <laughs> right? And so it's like, so what is making me not want to show up for my life? What is making me not excited about my life? And again, what am I willing to do? How can I, if I can't move it out the house, can I move it over here? What does that look like? everything there are stages. What does that look like? So it's been a process, me coming into identifying my truth. And when I'm blocked and I'm, I get blocked, right? I don't know anyone that, I don't believe in the word guru. Like, I don't know any people like that. I know people who are continuing to see, continuing to show up and continuing to be where they are, even when that's uncomfortable. I have a friend, his name is Ralph. And he always says, sometimes grace doesn't feel graceful. I love that. Mm. Sometimes grace doesn't feel great. So when I don't know, I write and I may need to write two or three days just to get it all clear because when it's really embedded in my womb, it's going to take a couple of, of, you know, sit downs to start unearthing that and say, wow. okay, now what do we do? I think that that requires a lot of patience and faith, right? Faith. A lot of consistency. The faith is built. It's really consistency, right? Because I don't know that faith has many faces. Mm. I think faith means I'm devoted and I'm unwavering. And that hasn't always been the case. You know, when I'm in fear and I can't move, right? I mean, like I would have anxiety attacks that would shut me down for two, three hours. Couldn't move, couldn't. And so when I come out of it, it's like, okay, well, what can I do? And my friend talked about the point system. So give yourself a point when you do something you don't think you can do. And it sounds trite, but it was huge. Mm. It was huge. And so the the faith for me is when I start showing up honestly, when I start, when I, one, I identify my values and I begin to honor them, then I develop my emotional, my spiritual muscles. And so my muscle memory now is recalling other things, not just the stuff that didn't work. And so I develop a track record. So faith is established through consistency. They taught me to move my feet, train your feet. I love that. One step at a time, right? One step at a time. Absolutely. Can you uh, share with us a little bit about your business? Tell us about more grace. Yes, I would love to. I would love to. So let me first, we talked about fear, um, let me tell you how long it took for me to get the courage and the clarity to stand fully in this space. So mm. more grace came out of meditation. It came out of me um, just understanding that the corporate space that I had been in for years was not where I was supposed to be. And I was in corporate sales. Um, I did well in it because I like people. I like talking. And if I believe in what I represent and I would never work for a company whose product I didn't believe in and I was in media, right? So then I'm going to have a great time. However, outside of work, I've always gone into spaces where I could develop workshops. I did a lot of volunteering at shelters um, because I used to live in a shelter and I know that if my life is what it is now, the individuals who are there just starting 
they're going, these are future leaders. Yeah, they've had a setback right now, but the beauty of going into a shelter is different than someone who has a, a position and they are trapped by their rent or their mortgage or their image and what people are going to think. When you go into a shelter, you've surrendered all that. You've said, you know what? I, I don't know what to do anymore. I need some help. So you're going to start from the ground up. And I would go into shelters and volunteer my time and ask, hey, can I do a workshop? So I started developing these processes, methodologies that I had used in my own life that were proven effective. And I knew with more grace, I wanted to develop two sets of workshops, one for the individual. And that's where we really get into the core stuff because you can't really go into corporations and talk about your emotions. They're just not ready for it. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, they don't want you weeping on the floor, right? So, <laughs> so that's, that's the individual work. My workbook is really for the individual. Let's unpack core beliefs. Um, the workshops I developed with for companies is uh, building healthy partnerships. And so we look at the components of what makes relationships successful, how we show up. And so I can still take the emotional fitness spectrum, repurpose it so that it's appropriate for that space. And that is what More Grace does. I, I have the opportunity to you know, show up for different companies and, and participate from the workshop space and from uh, giving keynotes, but really it's just so that we can stand to our full height. That's what More Grace is about. It's about helping individuals address limiting beliefs that are unconscious. They're so recessed that they don't know that this is a belief that I'm operating from. And so More Grace is, is workshops to help us stand to our full height. And the workbook um, came out of that. The workbook came because my daughter found me after almost 25 years. I lost her three days after she was born because I was homeless and under the lash of addiction. And when I got my life together, she had already been adopted. I couldn't find her. It was a closed adoption. And I began celebrating her year after year by gifting other mothers and daughters because I refused to live in shame right? We work with people who are coming from a place of shame, coming from a place of guilt. You can tell in the way they behave, how they're tucked into themselves already. And so I just didn't want to live that way. I kept hoping if my daughter one day found me that she wouldn't be embarrassed. And I didn't want to just show up as some corporate person. I wanted to show up as a full bodied individual who stood for something. And so I thought I was going to have this huge glamorous life. And you know what? Healing is glamorous though, right? Mm. There's nothing more beautiful. There's nothing more stunning than someone who goes from feeling broken to standing with their head up and their shoulders squared, man. And so my daughter found me in 2020. And from that being reunited with her and her daughter, which is my grandbaby and just changed my entire life came the calendar. So it's important that I give you the timeline, the calendar. My daughter suggested I do a motivational calendar because she loved how my life looked. Oh. I took her to one of the shelters I still volunteer at. I go and I do trauma workshops for fun and for free. I took her there because I wanted her to see my life. And she said, you should do a motivational calendar. I never thought that I would be that woman. I used to live in a way that people turn their nose up at, you know, they, they didn't want to be around me because of how I lived and, and my life has come together and I feel I'm a contributing member of society. And so the calendar is named after my daughter, the Serenity calendar. Now there's the Serenity 2024 calendar. Every inspiration is meditated over and created to bring light to the space that someone occupies. And I'm so grateful that people have continued to support it. And after I did the calendar, I sat down and I did the workbook. And I want to tell you, I had to grieve so many times. I would stop for one to two weeks when I was putting together my workbook, Let's Unpack Core Beliefs. Because although I've done so much work, I had to grieve for the child that I was, the young adult that I was who didn't know. 
I was I was operating under the the um, weight of other people's opinions about who I was, what I was, and what I was supposed to do. And so stepping out into carving out my own identity, wow. So I got to see that as I I laid out, it's an autobiographical workbook, Let's Unpack Core Beliefs. It is my legacy. If I If my life were to stop right now, I am so pleased that that is what represents me because it takes you into, tra you can't heal trauma from the outside. You got to go in. Mm -hmm. You got to go into where it is and start clearing out from there. And so that is what more grace is. That is who I am. That is what I do. And uh, and I'm freaking thrilled. <laughs> I'm freaking thrilled. I am so inspired and, and so incredibly proud of you too. It's just My friend. It's such Aww. beautiful, important work. And uh, where can we find this work? How, how can we find this work? How can we find so, you? Yes, please reach out to me. My website, more-grace.com. So M-O-O-R-E-G-R-A-C-E.com. And, uh, and the workbook, Let's Unpack Core Beliefs. I and love it. Some work. Do you have a favorite quote or, or I do. passage? I do. I do. I do. So, um, and my quotes change depending on where I am, right? As I sure. move into different stages of my own emotional development. Uh, so I used to be in corporate events uh, and that was the last company I worked for. And we did these huge events all over the world. Um, and I was at an event and there was a speaker, Mike Dominguez, and he said, if serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. Mm. And it literally just, because I believe in servant leadership, that is who I am. If serving is beneath you, then leadership is beyond you. If you can't serve, you can't lead. If you're not willing to roll up your sleeves and do the work necessary, you can, I don't want your opinion. I want your experience. We have too many opinions that don't actually have experience with what we're talking about. So, yeah, I'm so that's, glad you. That's one of my favorites, too. I had yeah. no idea you were going to share that. The, yeah. the, there is something so, so beautiful. And as you were you were saying that based on what we talked about, like, I think about that as that inside work, right? It's like, yeah. we can't fully serve if yeah. we are in constant battle with ourselves. And it's just beautiful. And I love that we're recording this on, on the, on love day, because as I was hearing you talk, I, I just kept thinking about what, like, what's, what self-love looks like, you know, people are like, love yes. yourself and self-love. Yes. And it's yes. like, it's not that easy. What does it look like? Right. What does it look like? Right. So, so I just want to close it out with what, what does that look like for you? What is self-love self-worth? Where do we find that? And what does that mean? That's a speaker. Her name is Lisa Nichols, and she's one of my favorites. And she said, I've given myself a thousand second chances. And that requires compassion. Sometimes when we come from spaces of unhealed trauma, we are unforgiving with ourselves and we are unforgiving with others. And so for me, self-love is allowing myself to be where I am as long as I need to be there and being gentle, but but holding myself accountable as I move into a different space. It means honoring my values. If I say that this is important to me, then I need to stand in that space, even if it means standing alone. Because sometimes we're going to have to stand alone. Not everyone's going to understand. So self-love is treating myself with the dignity and respect that I'm going to ask from others. I can't ask it of you if I'm not willing to demonstrate it myself. You know, self-love and success, right? They're, they, for me, are the same. Success is loving and being loved, respecting and being respected, trusting and being trusted. And so that is also self-love. 
Candice, thank you so much. This thank is you, literally Nina. such a dream. I just love, love listening to you. I was so excited about today. I said, I'm going to hang out with Nina. We're going to chop it up a little bit. Yeah, my yeah. friend. Absolutely. And I can't wait to see you too. So yes, yes. We'll get together soon. We either are. in your neck of the woods or you're back in mine. Yep. So we can sit down. Yeah. Down. Yeah. Candace, thank you so much. And for everyone listening, be sure to visit Candace's website more uh, dash grace.com take a look at the workbooks and and all the things that are available to you and if you have any questions of course you can visit candace um, at her website you can also message us at awesome at passion squared.net or dm us and we will connect you um with this amazing human and leader and just ball of love. I just really want you all to experience uh, Candace's magic as I've been able to all these years. And for everyone listening, thank you. You know, I know sometimes the world feels a little, a little much or, or overwhelming. And actually I've had some really weird energy stuff going on this week. And I just want to just make sure that you all know, everyone that's listening, I hope you really, really know how grateful I am for you and how much I love and adore you. It is because of you that I am able to create this for you every day and that Passion Squared exists. So I'm wrapping you with so much love and holding you in my heart even more today. Thank you so much for listening and have a peaceful day. Bye.